Good morning, everyone, and Merry Christmas. It's snowing in Alexandria, so we got a white Christmas in Alec anyway. But uh, it's coming. Snow is coming. I can guarantee you that. This morning on this uh, Christmas Eve Sunday, I have asked to have the scripture switch to uh, the Luke reading, so we got it twice, so now you really understand it, right? And I'm going to just boil it down to this, that one little statement there in the, all those verses as a part of this marvelous account of the birth of Christ. And these words are sad words. There was no room in the inn. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may your word give us not only the truth, but encouragement. Might it speak to our hearts. You, O Holy Spirit, will you take that and work through these words that we might be ministered to on this Christmas Eve day as we celebrate your coming into the world, Jesus. Thank you for coming. And then also, Jesus, thank you for being present here. Amen. The story is told of a little Douglas, who uh, was a nice lad, was part of the Sunday school program, but they didn't know quite where to put him because he kind of messed things up along the way, but they wanted him to be involved. So they made him the innkeeper in the story of the coming of Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. And as they came forward, Douglas really got caught up into the story. And uh, his lines were simple. Just what I read here this morning. There's no room here in the inn. But Douglas was so broken about this message and he was so much into it that as Mary and Joseph bowed their heads and turned to leave then finally Douglas just broke all chains and he said just a minute you can have my room (laughs) you know this is a this I think really communicates what I want to get across here this morning the dilemma of no room for Jesus I believe that a part of the miracle of God's creation of mankind sometimes kind of just goes right by us. And and I suppose it's because there's no specific verse in Scripture that says this, and yet the whole message implies it. And I went looking for it this week, and I searched and searched but couldn't find it. But I believe, and that's, uh, I believe that the teaching of Scripture says that we have been created by God not only to serve him and worship him, but that we have been created for him to dwell within us. And if Jesus is not our Savior, you know what? We're incomplete. I will just illustrate that. When God was done creating mankind and all of creation, he's, we have it recorded It is good. It is good. And it was. But we also know from the biblical account that Adam sinned. And in this fallen condition that they passed this on to all mankind. Paul writes to the Romans saying, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Did you hear that? Because all sinned, and that includes you and me. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul writes, And you were dead in your trespasses and sin. For that reason, God took the necessary drastic action to promise and fulfill this miracle that took place that we are celebrating during this Christmas season that he became a man. He, he was born a woman, true man. And it's not just the story of Christmas and this babe, but it is the full story all the way to Calvary and beyond to the resurrection and to the ascension. Jesus did it all for us. What a miracle of love that is. We sang just a bit ago, Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in Bethlehem's home, there was found no room for thy holy nativity. 
I was reading uh, Max Lucado re recently, a quote from him. Some of the saddest words on earth are, we don't have room for you. Jesus knew that sound of those words. He was still in Mary's womb when the innkeeper said, we don't have room for you. When he hung on the cross and was, it wasn't the message of utter rejection, we don't have room for you in this world. Even today, Jesus is given the same treatment as he goes from heart to heart asking if he might enter. When we use the word room, it has a greater implication than just some physical place, but it has to do with our time, it has to do with our priorities, and I think there's been said maybe non-verbally, but thought, I don't have time for you, Jesus, or Jesus and salvation, well, that's not up on my, high on my priority list. I want you to understand this morning on this Christmas Eve day, 2017, Jesus is coming right now to ask you that if you have not let him enter your life to make you complete as a person, hear the words of Jesus communicated through John in the great book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Any man hear my voice and opens the door. I will come in and the old version said sups with him or to dine with him and he with me. The greatest gift, folks, the greatest gift given to you is not under the tree, but hung on Calvary's cross. Life eternal, second birth. What a great gift God has given to us in Jesus. Will you let him in? Major Whittle wrote in his hymn, Room for Jesus, King of glory, hasten now his word obey. Swing your heart door widely open and bid him enter, if you may. This is the good news, even as the angels announced to the shepherds that night. And when they went away, it, it said there that we saw that in the reading and heard that in the reading, let us go straight to Bethlehem and see this thing that happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And so they did. And as they went, they wasted no time. They got, they got right with it. And you know what? They didn't take one lesson in evangelism or any other instruction. It was a moving of the Spirit of God as they received the good news, and they said, we want to hear more about it. Is that hunger in your life uh, today? I know that sometimes I have to confess, Lord, it's not always up there where it ought to be, and yet the Bible says, and Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. These other things will take care of themselves. So as we accept Christ and have this gift in our life as a priority of our life, we have a future and a hope. And that's why, secondly, this morning, I want you to know that there is room for you in God's kingdom. God wants his heaven full. It's God's will that all men be saved and come to the truth. That's what the Bible says. Jesus in the parable of the great dinner, where the, the man, the master, the man with means, invites people to the great dinner. And as the servant goes out to tell him, now's the time to come, he gets one excuse after another and after another. And upon hearing that, the master then says to his servant, well, you go on back out again. And go to the highways and along the hedges and compel them to, kin, to come in that my house might be full. God wants his house full. He wants you there. He wants me there. There is room in God's heaven for you and for everyone who has room for Jesus in their heart. There are specific promises from Jesus for you and me. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me, said Jesus. 
in my father's house are what? Many rooms, many dwelling places. And this is what he goes on to say. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Did you catch that? That where I am, you may be also. Daniel Webster Whittle, born November 22nd, 1840, there in Chicopee Falls, Massachusetts. Now, I don't know where that is. I should have looked it up on the map. I didn't do that. But as a young man, he joined other young men and, and moved west and went his all the way to Chicago. And there he decided he would make his living. I believe he worked in a bank or it said some type of uh, office job. But in uh, 1861, he decided to join the uh, 77th Illinois Infantry as a second lieutenant. And it was only a year later that his regiment was activated, ordered south to join the Union Army, and he fought in the Civil War. And it was at the Battle of Vicksburg, and the historical accounts that I looked up had uh, some conflict in this, but uh, this much seemed to be unified, that he was wounded, seriously wounded, so that he was hospitalized. Now some said he lost his arm, and another said he had it in a sling, so I don't know what the truth is. The truth is that he was in the hospital, see, that's the point. And when he was there in the hospital uh, recovering, he looked around and found a New Testament and picked it up and began to read. And it really got a hold of him and, and gave great interest in it. Was this, this was truth. He saw these things. And, and by the way, by then he was a major. They called him Major Whittle, Whittle all the time after that. He was always known not so much as, as uh, Daniel Whittle, but as Major Whittle. At, during this time, as he was reading the scriptures and very interested, it hadn't yet come to him about a personal relationship, about Christ living in his life. But one night, an orderly came to him, and the orderly told Major Whittle, a young man who is dying as requested for someone to come and pray with him. So he says, I, would you go and pray with this young man? And, and Major Whittle said, me? I don't know. I don't know. That's not for me. The orderly said to him, well, you, you've been reading the Bible. I figured you were a Christian. Well, he tried to boom off, but then he paused and he said, you know, I'm, I'm a major. These are one of my men. So now he writes, and I quote him, Major Whittle, I went and knelt alongside this young man and held the boy's hand in mine. In a few broken words, I confessed my sins and asked Christ to forgive. Now, I believe right there that he did forgive. I then prayed earnestly for the boy. He became quiet and pressed my hand as I prayed and pleaded God's promises. Then I rose from my knees. He was dead. But a look of peace had come over his troubled face. And I cannot but believe that God who used him to bring me to the Savior used me to lead him to trust Christ's precious blood and find pardon. I hope to meet him in heaven. This is the same Major Whittle, who when he returned to Chicago, met D.L. Moody <laughs> and P.P. Bliss, whom I'm going to mention next week. And they encouraged him to take his poetry and apply it to music. He was quite a musician, and he eventually became an evangelist. But he's the one that wrote, Have you any room for Jesus, who bore your load of sin? As he knocks and asks admission, 
Sinner, will you let him in? Room for pleasure, room for business, but for Christ the crucified, not a place that he can enter in the heart for which he died. Have you any room for Jesus as in grace he calls again? Today is time accepted tomorrow. You may call in vain. Room and time now give to Jesus. Soon will pass God's day of grace. Soon thy heart left cold and silent and thy Savior's pleading cease. Room for Jesus, King of glory. Hasten now his word obey. Swing the heart's door widely open. Bid him enter while you may. God touched Major Whittle, and God wants to touch our hearts today. For he has a future in the hope. He has a place for you. Does he have a place in your heart? May God, by his grace, encourage you. And by his grace, help you. To have that heart and to guard that place in your life. Jesus, Jesus, only Jesus. We thank you, Lord for the good news that you desire to live with us, for the good news that you came into the world, for the good news of the future that you give to us. Amen.